now it's okay. We have, we have a good, nice group of folks tonight. We're inviting people every time now, Matt. Like, who can we invite for budget talks? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the January curriculum committee meeting. Uh, my name is Matt Marshall. I'm the committee chair. We go this way and come back to the hand. Uh, sure. Hi, I'm Tony V. Terry, do they see you or do they see them? They see them. Okay. Veronica Babcock. Matt Williambridge. Diane Potter. Angela. And I am the director of curriculum, Angela Hardy. Terry? Terry McGuire, Director of Technology. Do we want to introduce? Uh, we can if, if you're okay. If with you it. could introduce yourself, it'd be wonderful. Sure. Kristen Perry, Literacy Coach at Gardner Regional Office. Kathy Lavoy, Literacy Coach for Grades 3 through 5 at Riverview and HT, and Kristen on the three schools. Karen Collin, I'm also a literacy coach, and I'm mostly working with pre K through second grade this year at Pittston. Um, the Helen Thompson School and Laura LR. Um, Lindsay Bickford, I am a math coach at LER, uh, serving pre K to two, Pittston doing K five, and HT pre K to three. Thank you for all being here, Angela. And we are missing one math coach, um, Nicole Barton. She is middle school, um, Riverview and Helen Thompson grades three through five. Um, and she's in quarantine, <laughs> not with us today. Uh, but we can't stream people in, so. Um, but Nicole provided us some notes that Lindsay has and she'll integrate them into her conversations and answers and anything she can't do, I will do. And she's watching the live stream. She is, hi, Nicole. <laughs> um, great. So thank you all for coming. Hi, Teresa. Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. Just We just got started. Um, thanks for coming today. The agenda item is instructional coaching. Uh, we do this every January for the last few years to get a kind of mid-year check. Um, we've spent time uh, really in the past understanding, oh, can you hear this? Thanks. Understanding what coaching is. Um, we've invited Paula Burke in, who is a local resident and also a literacy coach in the Augusta schools when we were exploring the idea of having a literacy coach. Now we have three. Um, we uh, went from one math coach in 2018, um, Lindsay and I entered the district at the same time, uh, to two math coaches as of this year. Uh, you had originally invested in three, um, but we couldn't find a third. <laughs> so uh, we're at two. <laughs> uh, so what, what I like to do is open it first with kind of where are we at? What does the data say? Uh, and then invite the coaches to share a little bit of their perspective and then just open it for Q&A for you because it's a real opportunity for you to get their perspective. Usually the coaches come back at the end of the year if that's something you want. Um, although one year we got swayed because of, you know, COVID. Um, <laughs> but we can do that. One of the other things I've been toying around with is whether or not there might be some teachers who at, at that point in time might be comfortable sharing their experiences to kind of get their perspective on coaching. Um, but that will be up to you. So you can go through today's experience and let me know if that's something you want uh, to pursue in the future. Okay. So Terry, we'll share the um, tab I have. Let me know if there's anything I need to do. Um, and for the people in the room, you all have a hard copy of what I'm going to share. And we'll include it in the minutes when those are made. Great. So I just opened up with the first part, which is kind of like, how did your coaching um, numbers change over time? We do pay for coaching with a balance of local dollars in your MSAD 11 budget and federal dollars coming from one of the federal COVID grants, ESSER, ARP, or CRF. Different people are in different grants, so I 
can't really remember which one, but federal funds. So some of our coaches are currently funded in a short-term two-year plan, and some are funded in our local budget. So that's something when we get into budget talks, we'll have to kind of look at. Talk through. Um, there's some exciting data to share once we put it together. Our coaches are really good. They, have, they each have a spreadsheet, and they're required to track um, the work they do over time. Um, they're pretty detailed sheets. And then it moves into an aggregate for each one. So I see numbers, not necessarily people. Um, and then we use that data to kind of look across the district. So with that being said, um, not yet impacting the high school. We don't have any coaches targeted at the high school yet. Um, we have 85% of our K-8 staff or pre-K-8 staff actually have engaged with coaches this year. Um, with uh, at the elementary, sorry, at the elementary level, 85% of our, our, our educators have engaged with coaches. And at the middle school level, which is the first year we've ever had middle school coaching, 40% uh, of the staff at the mid-year have engaged with coaches. However, 100% of the math staff have, and we have a math coach, <laughs> and 100% of the ELA staff have, and we have a literacy coach. Um, so we're expanding that a little bit over time into other content areas. Um, but that's pretty exciting. <laughs> uh, good numbers. Um, and then the requests. So when teachers actually request time, teachers or um, interventionists request time with a coach, we track that. Um, so in 18, 19, when Lindsay was on her first year, she had 49 requests at mid-year. So up to this point. Um, and then the following year, Karen joined. No, this was just Lindsay. The following year was just Lindsay, 93 requests. And then 2021, I don't have data from right now. Um, Karen joined us that year and we also hit massive COVID time. And so our data was a little wonky and we didn't end up having a meeting here with the board about the coaching. Uh, so we jumped ahead to this year. So this January, the mid-year check is 550 teacher-initiated requests. Two. Yeah. Wow. You guys have been busy. Yeah. <laughs> and last so, year we did have a lot of requests, although it was it was it was different types of requests, and it was different because of the hybrid model. So yeah, yeah. So that was that's kind of exciting um, at mid-year levels. And then just for your information, we actually track how many requests under each category, um, but we can go into that in the spring because there was some, one of the spreadsheets didn't read quite right. So, um, so I just showed you the types of reasons that they request and that's what we're, they'll talk with you a little bit more, but you can see, um, you know, data, uh, building relationships across classrooms and students, uh, a lot of time on, um, uh, co-planning, co-teaching, observation and feedback, uh, data analysis, professional learning, communities, uh, small group co-teaching, which they'll talk a little bit about that, and modeling instructional strategies. Um, so it kind of goes all over the place in, in terms of a staff member's readiness um, and, and need. And then some other data that you've asked for before, what is a coaching, our coaching ratio? So the recommended kind of in the field coaching ratio is one coach per 25 staff. Historically, we've had one coach to 61 staff. Um, and that's when we were only working at the elementary level. And this is more like teacher level staff, even though other staff actually access them. So I didn't include administrators in this, I didn't include um, some of our ed support staff who are um, is instructional in nature. Uh, and so that would skew our numbers differently, but this, so this is just um, teacher positions. Uh, so currently at the K-8 level, we're actually, which surprised me because I didn't know until I calculated it, we're at a one to 25. So, um, so that's not including the high school, although we're starting to touch the high school a little bit in different ways, which would absolutely skew this number um, again, but for now that's where we're at. And then um, it's really important not just to know that 550 number, but who are we talking, who are the coaches working with? But how many times do they just work with a teacher one time? 
Um, and, and that's not necessarily PLCs where they're all together and it's a routine meeting. Um, or how many times do they work with a teacher five or more times? So there's some depth going on. They're ongoing work in classrooms with students and teachers. So this is showing us that at this point this year, more than 40, I think it's actually 41 teachers are meeting with coaches more than five times um, with a coach, a single coach more than five times. So that teacher could be meeting with a math coach two times and a literacy coach 10 times, right? It, it sort of depends. Um, fewer than 10 are meeting four times. 10 teachers are meeting, have met three times. Uh, just under 20 have met two times and just under 20 have only met one time. Um, so those actually are pretty good. You want that five or more really showing up to be your predominant number and it is. So that's exciting. And then some of the other things they do outside of coaching, because um, everyone wears multiple hats, <laughs> is uh, because of their expertise in either uh, numeracy or literacy, or instructional strategies in general, we have drawn on them to help us in professional learning across the district. So as you can see here, they've worked with um, our administrators on in-depth understanding of up-to-date literacy practices and numeracy practices so that they can follow through um, with feedback and support to staff. They've worked on um, our we have a new benchmark reading assessment in our intervention space, so they provided training there, uh, phonemic awareness training for our early educators, a lot of literacy training on using decodables, which is a practice that's becoming systematic for us in our early programming, um, listening comprehension or rethinking reading comprehension in our elementary grades, uh, our assessment and instructional resources training, fluency training, program training, like implementation of programming, specific training at the middle school on differentiation um, and instructional strategies, and math diagnostic interview training at the middle school also. And that's just the tip of the iceberg at this point um, of where we're at. And our all our coaches are engaged in PLC meetings routinely across the district, so grade level um, meetings that happen routinely with administrators. And they also meet um, monthly, I think, with every administrator team, um, as a team with administrators. Um, that they do not share any information about individual teachers, That's, um, but it's an opportunity to think about patterns, trends, instructional um, implications, assessment information, things like that. So that's the data I have to share with you. That's what you have in front of you. Um, and we'll include that in the minutes. So Terry, do I just unplug or, okay. What I'd like to do is give an opportunity for the coaches to actually talk <laughs> and share their, a little bit of, uh, a little tidbit or a little opening um, of math and one of ELA, and then just give you the floor to ask questions and learn from each other. So Lindsay, why don't you start us off with math? So first off, I want to thank the board for supporting more coaches because I came in by myself and I was the one person to 61. <laughs> and now looking at this, that we had 550 requests in a year, I'm like, I was still by myself. <laughs> like, uh, it's a little overwhelming to think about. So it has caught, it, well, technically in numbers, it's cut my load down, but it doesn't feel like it's not any less work. Like I'm still doing the same amount. I'm just getting more requests and more in the classroom. Um, so thank you for that. Um, coaching has definitely changed since I started in 2018. So like my first year is really building relationships. And then year two, I really got into coaching cycles and COVID hit. And then we got Karen and it was wonderful. And we did a lot of like tech integration support. How do we do this? How do we do remote learning? That type of thing. And now this year we're working a lot, at least in math world on differentiation and how to help teachers. Um, meet those kids that might be a little further behind than we're used to and still meeting the needs of those kids too that are up higher and maybe a little more advanced than what we're used to and trying to help them manage all the different levels within their classroom. I'm still doing coaching cycles within that. Um, also this year, Nicole and I have been working with Cheryl Toby at Maine Math and Science Alliance to bring fluency assessing and the EMDI to the district. So our Title I teachers have already done the EMDI regularly for the past few years. Angela, do you remember when we brought that in? 2019. 2019. 
2019. So we've done that. So now um, Nicole and I are both trained. So as we want new staff in the district to do the EMDI and implement that, if we need that, we can actually train them in-house and not have to send them to an outside training. Uh, we're also doing a 10 module fluency training with our Title I teachers and staff. Um, which will probably expand out and we'll adjust for more staff next year. So that's something we've been working on. So we can do that in house and again, not have to send teachers elsewhere. We can just do it with them ourselves. And that's 27 hours of training. Yeah. 27 hours of training with um, our in math interventionists. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it is throughout the year. We're trying to do like once a month so that we're not pulling them and we're trying to do the half days. So they're getting year-long training on fluency and it's been great especially getting to know them better and just as a team um nicole and i also took some teams to do a virtual math pact training with the department of ed which was really interesting so there's a book called the math pact and it's really about starting a whole school math agreement so really making sure we have common language as we're moving throughout the grades like if you say hey this number is on top what does that mean are we talking fractions? Are we talking additions? Like, what are we talking about? So it really started to open the door for conversations at Helen Thompson, which is the group that I went with, and at the middle school where Nicole went with, um, talking about, well, what, are, what terms are we using? What are we, like, we want to be consistent, especially as kids are funneling into the middle school, coming from four different elementary schools, well, three. Um, are we using that same consistent language or kids having different knowledge from different places? So it really got that conversation started for things that we can work on. Um, we've also been doing a lot of like small things based on teacher requests that aren't necessarily on this sheet that you have. So um, teachers might say, hey, I really need games to do some math stations and I want to do this, but I don't have a game. And instead of having them search and search and try to find something that's gonna work for what they need, I already have a bank, so I've been making some things for them if they need it because they don't have time right now. So if I can quickly pull and make a game for them that they need for their classroom, great, awesome, I will do that. So I've done that a few times. Um, and then in general, since the new year has started and we're getting new data coming in from the iReady Diagnostic, I think Nicole and I are definitely on the same page. I think you guys are too, that things are picking up and schedules are getting crammed with how are we going to differentiate for these kids and what are we going to do and so coaching cycles are starting to start really quickly since vacation so that's been great um so from nicole i have a write-up um so she's really enjoyed the coaching team for msad 11 um the majority of her work at the middle school has been working with math teachers to implement formative assessments and analyze the data to make instructional decisions within their units um, she's been coaching teachers on the implementation and use of pre-assessment data, along with open up curriculum's cool down data to monitor student progress and to make instructional decisions that support student growth. Um, the data also helps the teacher differentiate instruction to meet the needs of students within their classrooms. She supports the process by collaborating with teachers, creating resources to support differentiation and reflecting with the teacher as they move through the process. At the elementary school levels, um, she has been supporting the implementation of iReady Classroom. She uses the diagnostic data reports to meet the needs of their students. She's been coaching teachers and breaking down grade level proficiency standards to meet the needs of students to develop conceptual understanding to support student growth. Um, and within the instructional coaching team, She's worked with Kirsten to present differentiation workshop to the middle school teachers and continue to provide support during the PLC meetings. Um, she also mentioned how we've been working with Title I teachers on providing professional development on mathematics fluency training to support student growth. She's also started working with different grade levels on identifying and aligning essential standards for mathematics and creating common success criteria to promote equity amongst learners. Um, and she is really bummed. She was really looking forward to meeting you guys today and not here. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, do we want to do an a ELA, just an orientation? Because you'll see some trends about coaching. It doesn't, no matter the content, some of the features that are the same, and then you can kind of dive in. 
Sure. Um, so being the first literacy coach last year to join um, Lindsay, I have to say I, I have the same thank you message to, to you and Angela for supporting this vision of, of increasing the coaching. And um, Lindsay did such a great job setting the stage for coaching because from being in other districts and being a literacy coach, I've been a classroom teacher for many years and then moving into coaching and being a literacy specialist like Title I reading specialist um, and working in different districts. Um, not everyone has the same vision for coaching like Angela does and how she has supported this, this growth with coaching and student-centered focus. Sometimes it's more teacher-centered and it feels evaluative in some places and it, there's really been a big shift away from that. So it's really about the kids and we want student growth. That's our ultimate goal. And we can support teachers along the way as well, obviously with their learning and we can all learn from each other. So it's not a one-sided thing where we're you know, providing them with the knowledge. We've learned lots of things from them as well. So it's like a partnership and it's a really great approach. So because Lindsay had that same vision, the teachers were so comfortable understanding what coaching was, the student-centered approach, that it made it a lot easier for me to come in because they already had such a positive experience. And they have been so welcoming. And as you can see by our data, which is really exciting, it's the first time I saw it all compiled together the way Angela has it. Like, wow, we have so many people that are um, asking us to come back multiple times. And that has been huge. Um, last year, you know, one advantage to the hybrid model and all the technology use and having to go remote, having Lindsay and I as a resource, as you mentioned, like helping them to make something or a tool, they might not have the time to research it because they're trying to plan for literacy and math and juggling the two cohorts. And so we could say, hey, we have this tool. We can help you to create something that's going to be engaging during this remote learning because that's another strat, you know, thing that was difficult. So it, um, they asked us for help a lot. So I got to build relationships that way, sometimes helping with technology, but to make a literacy practice more engaging in, in the remote learning world. Um, so that was wonderful. This and I also was trying to work with K to eight last year, mostly focused on K five, but I did touch the middle school a little bit last year, which was great, um, just with a few people, but mostly the K to five. And I was trying to get to all buildings, so of course we didn't have as many multiple hits. I was it was a lot of small touches with a lot of people, um, and some multiple requests. This year, because we were so lucky to be able to add two more literacy coaches who I have worked with in other um, roles at different times, and we're part of the same. Um, partnership for comprehensive literacy through the University of Maine. We have an affiliation um, with you, Maine Orno, and um, we have a membership. We get our own professional development through them, which Angela has helped us to um, continue. And um, because we have the extra literacy coaches, now we've been able to kind of divide and conquer a little bit. So I'm generally working now with pre-K. We add pre-K too, which is also exciting because pre-K wasn't really involved. They always feel like they're on their own island sometimes. So it's really nice for pre-K to be involved in, in this a little bit. And so I'm mostly working with pre-K to two. And then we have, we can do the three, five band and the, um, and the middle school and also special ed and title one teachers often reach out to us as well, which we didn't break it down by who mostly it's general ed classroom teachers, but sometimes special ed and title one consult with us as well and ask for support. Um, one, one thing that's been really great about including pre-K and they were really appreciative when Angela talked about the professional development, really important, crucial early literacy practice is phonological awareness. And we included this training for pre-K, K and one and the pre-K teachers in the district all were like, thank you so much for including us. This really makes um, that continuity from pre-K to kindergarten so wonderful. And the kindergarten teachers next year are gonna be celebrating because they're gonna see these huge strengths coming, even with, you know, a lot of people being out and missing multiple days because of COVID, those pre-K kids are going to be prepared and they're going to understand the same routines and skills that they'll be doing in kindergarten for that literacy curriculum. And it was a one-time small purchase where now they'll have that material to use over and over again. There's no consumables. So that's really helpful. Um, like Lindsay said, most of our work has been this year, um, co-teaching, co-planning, um, and differentiating, I would say, has been a big one because there are some gaps. Um, and the gaps, there's always gaps every year. Before COVID, we always had like, you know, the, the spread of, of kids in a classroom at different levels in elementary world, especially. And now the spread has gotten a little bit bigger and that's everywhere. So helping them to 
um, design some small groups within their class for maybe a, a lower level that they're not used to. And like Lindsay said, also we're working right now with a teacher um, in second grade to support a student who needs enrichment and what would that look like? And is there anyone else we could partner that student with and, and to provide some support for them since they don't start GT till third grade. So um, we can provide enrichment opportunities as well. So we're gonna help to plan and we did some testing that the classroom teacher doesn't have time to do so that we can consult and, and support them in that way with the enrichment as far as for um, remediation. And then um, what else? I guess one challenge that's, of course, like it's everywhere with coaching this year has been um, just getting some of it going. We're getting excited and we're seeing growth and then someone's out because of COVID or we're starting to work with a group of kids and then the kid's gone. So sometimes that consistency, it's, it, it makes us sad because <laughs> we, we might plan on being there to work with a group of kids and we're just starting to get momentum going and then there's you know absences and stuff. So that's really the only challenge that we've had um, yeah, and our own professional development so that like Lindsay said, we can provide that professional development that a one day conference, a lot of times if you don't have coaches, you send teachers to professional development one day here, one day here, they don't have the time to practice and consult with other people and really be able to internalize that and transfer that knowledge to help. But because we get to go to a lot of professional development, we're able to support them and do that kind of training and we'll have the resources. So then we look at the student needs, we'll help them to, to plan for either a whole class, small class, or kind of one-on-one. -on -one. That's mostly what I wanted to say for now. So <laughs> probably you have some of the same things. You're gonna hear the same message. Oh, and feel free to build. It's okay if it's shorter, because she said some of it. It doesn't mean we won't think anything less. Well, I can tell you about myself. I'm actually, I'm not just new to coaching in this district, I'm fairly new to the district. I came last year in October as the Title I Literacy Interventionist at Riverview. And because I, after um, being a coach for about 10 years in another school district, mostly because I felt like I needed a change. <laughs> COVID affected us in lots of ways. I think that's the way it affected me. And then when this position opened up, I decided I was really missing it. <laughs> and I really wanted to go back. I missed the professional development. I missed the work with teachers in the classroom and with kids um, working with them to help differentiate instruction and that student-centered coaching. One thing I will say is that for me this year, a lot of my role, especially at the beginning of the year, was about building relationships because except for the people at Riverview, the teachers at Riverview, I, they were the only ones I knew. So when I started this year, I was new to everybody, the teachers at Helen Thompson and the teachers at Pittston. So um, we started the year out um, getting together with them and going in and visiting their classrooms, making my face known so that kids would recognize me and they would get used to seeing me around. And now we've moved into a lot, of, a lot of that, what we're calling student-centered coaching. And Karen's right, coaching has changed a lot from 10 years ago when I trained. It's not, it, it's still there to support the teacher and to help build the capacity in teaching and instruction, but the main focus are the kids. Where are they at? What do they need? Where do we go? And how are we gonna work together? It's about collaboration. How are we going to collaborate and come together to help them meet their goals while at the same time lift the teaching capacity um, so that we're getting the biggest bang for our buck and um i notice uh some people wonder well you're going in and doing small group work um how is that affecting the teacher over here and i actually this year not too long ago um I was, I'm working with a small group in word work. Uh, no, I'm not in word work, this is comprehension. And I'm happy, I do the group right in the classroom. That's one of the things that when, I try to always make sure that's possible because the teacher, I want their eyes and ears on what's happening with that small group too. And we also have planning meetings and then we have check-in meetings and we were doing the like progress monitoring meeting, determining whether the kids have made any progress, how it was going, do we need to continue? Are we done with this particular cycle or do they need more? And one of the things I asked her during that is, how does me being in the classroom and doing this group in here, how is that helping you? 
as a teacher. And she said, well, she goes, I can hear everything you're saying because she's over here and it's quite quiet usually in our room when we're doing it during independent reading time and I'm working over here. So she's hearing the teaching that's going on and the conversations. And she said, oftentimes I'll think, oh, maybe that's something I can take to the rest of my class. Maybe that's the language I need to be using um, with them too. I need to be um, taking that on. So they are hearing and listening. So you are coaching over here and also supporting the students over here. And just the other day, one of the things we do in a pre-planning meeting is the very first meeting is to, um, who are the students that you're concerned about? Um, we're gonna have to come up with a plan. So um, we usually do some assessments or we go by work that the teacher has collected and gathered in the classroom and take a look at student work and determine what needs are and then determine what standard and target we need to focus on. And then I usually go back and just take our, the information that we talked about and write it up and then I share it with them. And I just did one the other day for um, fifth grade writing and I found a lot of um, weak areas in um, language skills. And that was seemed to be their biggest point. They have to be able to write complex sentences and get beyond all of those pieces. And something as simple as, which I had never even thought of before, um, one of the things was the order of adjectives in a sentence. <laughs> they, didn't, they did not get that. So the new curriculum that we just took on, being a writer, has a component to it that's about skills instruction. And a lot of teachers are having a, trying to figure out how to pull that in and make sure that's getting used. But immediately I sent her the plan and I got an email right back from her. She goes, oh, this is so helpful. She goes, I think this week I'm gonna get out that skill skills book and we're gonna start doing some work through that. So there's a connection too. So we're just getting started. but. And what I like for the student center coaching approach is the balance between supporting the students and also supporting the teachers at the same time. So I don't mean to interrupt, but did you have to leave it for? Yeah, I, I can I can wait. Okay. I, just, like I just wanted question, to remind you. To answer. So before we go into the middle school English, which I also want to hear, do you have specific math questions you might have on mind that Lindsay can respond to? And and we can also record some questions and have follow-up in the minutes if things come up after Lindsay leaves. I just have one. Um, last meeting, we had an opportunity to talk to the teachers mm -hmm. about the new math curriculum. What are your thoughts or opinions on it? On which one are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so at elementary, they have choice. And at middle school, it's the open up. So we had Andrea and Aaron, um, and then a bunch of elementary staff. So if we're are you talking elementary? Yeah. Okay. So we have right now Pittston is doing San Francisco, which is an online program that was one of our top two choices. And then everybody else is doing Ready Classroom. There are some teachers in other places or teaching teams that are pulling some lessons from San Francisco because they like them better. Um, strategies between the two programs are the same. So it doesn't I know that the big concern is, okay, well, how come they get to do this? And the, the strategies are the same. They're still learning the same strategies for multiplication, division, addition, same thing. So really they're comparable structure-wise. San Francisco, I think, because it has the number tops built in, I prefer it a little bit more, um, but then there's perks to Ready Classroom that I like too. Um, they have the like objectives and, well, okay, more student-friendly learning targets at the beginning of each lesson, whereas San Francisco might not have that as well. But then San Francisco has these really nice closing questions and I might not like ready classrooms as much. So it's re So they're both good. They're both good. Okay. Yeah, they're both good. <laughs> and they're both like the strategies are the same. The kids are learning the same thing. We're making sure if so, um, we're each grade level met last year to decide, are we gonna teach ready classroom in order? Are we gonna rearrange some things? So some grade levels did rearrange some stuff because they're like, okay, this is gonna hit right before Christmas. We wanna give them a break from numbers. Let's do some geometry here. So we did some reordering. So when Pittston decided they were gonna to go to San Francisco last year, um, that was my June project. So I went through and made sure all of the San Francisco lessons by standard were gonna line up with Ready Classroom. So even if kids within the district are moving schools, 
they're learning the same strategies. They should be roughly in the same place. Granted, if there's been quarantines and all that stuff, but they should be roughly in the same place. So it shouldn't matter. That was my biggest worry would be making sure we're consistent and everybody's in the same place or roughly on the same thing. And, and that's, we're good. I think we're good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank you. One quick question slash comment. Um, I remember 2018 upstairs in the little room when you were telling me how busy you were and everything, and it was unreal. And so we've gone to this and so the, the 550 is the first thing that jumped out of the page of me, and that's awesome. Um, and I know you're going to go. So if, if you could just email me uh, after the fact, because it's a selfish question, because my son is differentiation or yeah, I'm screwing up the pronunciation of the word. He's way behind in math. So he's in title one every day and everything. So I was just wondering, and he's a fifth grader. So we're really concerned about him making the leap, you know, catching up and making the leap before he goes to middle school and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And we're working with, he's a Helen Thompson. So we work yeah. with Mrs. Folsom and Katie Gould and stuff like that. And it's been great. But I just wanted to email you a couple of questions. Yeah. And, and if someone else wants to talk about differentiation when you're going to pick up your kids, that would be interesting yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just add on that. What's really nice is because we have Nicole who's working in grades four to eight, Lindsay's also doing all of Pittston. So she's getting that four or five section again, <laughs> still. Yeah. Um, we're starting to build a bridge, right? So we know students in fifth grade have always come in out, you know, with a spread. <laughs> and now we're starting to, we're starting to get some consistency across that spread. And because we have someone that's crossing over, she's working directly with the middle school staff and she's getting to know the fifth, fourth and fifth graders, right? So, and then those kids are coming up to sixth grade. So I think we're gonna have a, a much stronger um, understanding of what's happening and we're gonna have a smoother transition from one year to the other or one building to another um, than we might've historically had. We're really excited by that. And I think it's been nice too having Nicole because there's been things that have come up in like third and fourth grade. I'm like, hey, I know what this looks like in Reddy and in San Francisco, but what is this going to look like and open up? Are they going to have a nice seamless flow or is this going to be a problem down the road? And so we've been able to try to start making those connections, which has been really nice without me having to be an expert in all things K-8. I think one other thing is we, we spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of time talking about learning loss for kids. But there's also a, a teaching loss, if you will, for lack of a better term. The teachers aren't in the classroom. They're not face-to-face -face with the students, with, with um, coaches every day. So I think that's probably the, the high number could be attributed to some of that, maybe. Um, I'm just throwing that out. I don't know if it is, but I mean, I would expect after being remote for, what, a year and a half, getting back in the classroom, we would probably have teachers that we're a little rusty, um, maybe a little concerned about their delivery. So, yeah. Well, and just the gap widened, right? right? It, it went it went from here to here. <laughs> so um, I don't want you to be late. Thanks. Uh, but I will record additional questions as they come up and I'll make sure I we, we come up with a crafted response and it will include it in the minutes so anyone can access them. And Thank you can you. email Nicole and I, and then okay. maybe we'll yeah. have similar different responses. Yeah. Or the same, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so middle school, ELA, Kirsten is new to us this year. Yes but not new to coaching. <laughs> so I want to thank all of you too for the opportunity to be uh, back in my complete comfort zone, uh, the middle school. I uh, spent the last uh, 10 years as a pre-K through grade eight literacy coach. And then before that, I worked for 25 years with middle school students in literacy and social studies. Um, so it's great to be back where I'm with my peeps. <laughs> so, um, as far as coaching goes, uh, entering the middle school, um, I was an unknown entity and there had not really been a lot of coach presence. Um, uh, certainly Karen was there, but being spread across the whole district, she wasn't and being remote and all of those things. So um, nobody really had um, a, a negative attitude about coaching and they were curious. I spent a lot of time getting to know people, but I have to say, um, in my experience in other districts that the teachers at the middle school are ready to work with coaches. They are open, they are excited, they are um, what's next. And 
in the past, I experienced them like, well, don't tell anybody that you're working with me because they felt it was for some reason a negative thing. But here in this district, coaching isn't about fixing the teacher. It's about growing students. And that was really exciting and refreshing for me to see. Um, a lot of my work this year has been around supporting teachers as they implement a new curriculum, a new curriculum that is pretty different from uh, the paradigm that they've been working from before. Most of the teachers used um, a workshop model. Um, a lot of their resources were developed over time. They had favorite books they taught. They had wonderful units that they had been using for years. Um, and now using a program felt very different. Um, from a kid perspective, what I've been seeing is that we have equity for our students. Um, whether you have a first year teacher or you have somebody who's been working for decades, that student gets a similar experience. They have access to beautiful literature, rigorous, rigorous tasks and skills. And um, so that's tricky to balance. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time working with teachers in that area. If you have any questions about Amplify, because I could talk about it for hours, but I won't, um, I'd be happy to answer those. I did want to talk about some of the other work that I've been doing. Um, in the past, the middle school had a very strong independent reading program. Uh, and actually, uh, when I met with the high school uh, depart English department, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, they were sort of lamenting that loss and they're recognizing it in their, their school now that they're seeing that kids are coming in, not feeling comfortable about independent reading and having that rich experience. And the middle school teachers are lamenting it. So we've been working hard to adjust the, um, the classroom time to build in independent reading time. Uh, that's relatively new work with trying to juggle the Amplify also. Um, and to support teachers, uh, I have um, I'm starting up a program called the Margin Pro Project, and we have um, I've purchased 30 books, and there's going to be a section in the library where these sit. And it's going to be well advertised, and there's special plates in the front of it. But the idea is that students come in and they grab a book, and then they write their name in the front of it. And um, so, for example, Kirsten Perry, I'm using purple ink, and then as I'm reading the book. I underline, I draw a picture, I ask a question, and I read the book and I put it back. And then I might say to my friend, hey, you gotta go read this book, it's awesome. So my friend goes in, grabs the book. Um, Kathy's gonna be using orange. And then Kathy go goes in and she gets to see what I'm thinking. She can ask questions, she can answer. She, And so in this world of, students not being able to have as many of these um, interactions with books and experience with books, they have that opportunity. So that's one of the projects. Another one is um, implementing a um, independent reading incentive program. And I don't, I'm not into pizza parties or anything like that, but I um, reached out to the art teacher and asked her for recommendations for students. Um, and we're going to be painting a tree in our middle school. This is actually the meeting is tomorrow. The, there are seven, students, middle school students, um, who are going to design the tree and place it in the cafeteria. And then as students read page numbers, not books, because we want to have volume, 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 um, they read um, 150 pages they get to put up. So this time of year, it's going to be a snowflake as the leaf, but in the spring, it might be a little bud that they get to add. And the, the idea is that every month or so we're shifting to keep that incentive and that excitement about reading going. So we're gonna hopefully cover the cafeteria with snowflakes and leaves and buds and all of those things. And then the third one is to get a um, book club, a uh, school-wide book club up and running. Um, and we do have, um, I've gotten permission to do that on um, the Wednesdays where we have uh, intervention time. Students who um, are available can join the book club um, and those two will shift over time and they will be student selected. Uh, so those three mini programs are designed to support teachers as they bring independent reading back into the classroom. So, um, and then the last thing that I just wanted to mention is I was invited to um, come up to the high school 
to the English department to introduce myself so they could meet me and so that I could meet all of them and put names and faces together. Um, and I talked about Amplify. Uh, they asked a lot of questions. Um, and we walked away with an excitement that we're going to have an opportunity to bridge between the middle school and the high school and bringing teachers together to do some professional development together. Um, and then uh, I had I made a connection with the high school librarian at that time also, who was very excited about the little projects that we're working on. So um, let's see. And I, I, I have a whole page full, but so I'm going to leave that to you to ask questions, unless there's something you want to ask. No, I think let's ask questions. Yeah. We have like just about 15 minutes. Um, so I just want to make sure you, whatever's on your mind. Let's, I know. Can I go again? Yeah. I'm cynical because kids are always in their heads and their phones and stuff like that. So the reading program, you have a lot of enthusiasm for. I would think it's an awesome idea. And, you know, I'm sure most of all of us in here grew up reading voraciously. But in this day and age of TikTok or whatever is there, is there a uh, enthusiasm for it? So that's, is that's, there hope for humanity? That's the work. That is the work, and um, what we have to do is make it so exciting and fun um, that students start, they've started a book in, in a classroom that they're really excited about because their teacher talked about it or one of their friends talked about it, and then it follows them home, and they're finding time. But that's work that has to happen, and there are lots and lots of pieces that we can bring in to support teachers to create this culture of reading and excitement around literacy. Um, so it's going to be a multi-tiered approach, and it's going to take a little bit of time, but absolutely, yes. Parent support as well. As absolutely. Yep. You know, parent, uh, you know, as a parent, I'd see my daughter walk through the, through the kitchen door with a, a book in her hand. I'm like, hey, what book is that? You know, and, and some, in some cases, it was a book that I read. You know, so. yep. A multi-tiered approach with teachers, students, community members, parents. I think it's exciting. The tree sounds wonderful. I think that that's a great way to get them interested. Um, I was fortunate to have children that read. So my son for discipline would be sent to his room where he would have a library and he would read a book. So it's like, do I go to go and tell him he can't read? But I think it's great to get interest because I know a lot of interest has gone away from this younger generation with reading. And I think that's really cool. I like the snowflake idea and the buds. And I think that's great. So idea. you won't mind, Teresa, if I ask you to cut out some snowflakes? No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Fantastic. I, just, I was writing, I was thinking of all you said. And um, I, don't, I didn't do this on purpose, but it seems like there's cooperation, connection, and confidence, so results of confidence, because you I taught a long, long time ago, and it seemed like such a lonely task because you cared so much and you didn't know how to help one when another one was at altogether different issues and, and in learning. And so I, it sounds wonderful. And I know nothing's ever perfect, but it sounds really like the good approach and that you've done it. The teachers aren't defensive. They're like, most of the time, I think teachers are, well, please, I want to help these kids, you know, anything you can do. But um, all I would say is I, I love to hear good stories. So if there's any, 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 anything without any naming names or schools <laughs> or anything, I love it. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of like bright spot moments of, mm -hmm. of things like that, because you're right. Like when I was a classroom teacher, teaching kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, I, I did not have a coach in the buildings where I worked, only one, and um, not in my building often enough that I felt like I could have someone in there often, and when I did, it was so nice to have one of the words that we like to use in coaching is like a thinking partner, because it, it, you do feel isolated. You're in a classroom all day with the kids by yourself. So to have that thinking partner person that you can say, hey, and that's why some of those, some of those one touch contacts with people could be very informal and not even planned. Sometimes you could be in the teacher's room. Like I might just be running to the restroom and just putting my stuff down and like having my lunch. 
And all of a sudden someone comes in and says, do you have a minute? <laughs> and then it turns into this great conversation because can I just brainstorm something with you? And I've had multiple times across all buildings where people just approach me like that and I'll think, make time for them. I, I've sometimes not eaten my lunch till 2.30. I know this, we all do this. That's not in this data either. Those that's not in the We didn't, include, we didn't even in include data. that in here because those are like things that are like very unplanned and spontaneous because sometimes those are, the, those are the exciting ones for us. Those yeah. are the great stories because all of us have shared with each other that that happens often. And sometimes that turns into something where then they're like, oh, can we talk about that more during like when my kids go to phys ed? or when my kids go to music, or after school. I, I can't tell you how many teachers, these are the most dedicated educators. Like Friday afternoon, I've, I've met with teachers like from three to four, and they're willing to do that on a Friday afternoon. And that was their idea. <laughs> and I'm like, so like, all right, I will definitely stay till four o'clock with you um, and brainstorm this more that might have started as this little brainstorm at, you know, lunch or recess and sometimes even going outside and when they have recess duty and chatting with them because you can scan and watch kids and now I'm another adult of their scanning watching children and we can just have a little informal conversation and that's also been helpful so yeah lots of things or even just um grabbing a resource like this isn't working I'm trying out this new lesson it's not working and we're both now two eyes two sets of eyes watching the kids hmm, what else may work instead and we can be brainstorming even right in the moment and and switch gears because we have some resources or strategies that maybe that are new or or just different and from teaching a different grade level or uh, working in a different building and then bring that into the, to the situation and then see how it impacts the students shift gears a little bit and I have to give kudos to the coaches because one, one of the things they they all agreed to implement this year was something called Book Me, and they include it on their email signature line. So uh, they constantly need to monitor their email and their calendars because, for example, today we were in a meeting with coaches from one to two, and Lindsay's like, oh, someone just booked me for 3.05. <laughs> I'm supposed to be here at 3.30. So she like as soon as our meeting was done, booked it over to that school, checked in with the teacher because she knew the teacher had a prep period and was like, can we meet now instead of 305? And so they always find a way to, to follow up and communicate and be responsive. And because they have multiple schools, they're often like trying to figure out how to, you know, navigate that and, and be as responsive as possible. Um, because just like they have in person spur of the moment conversations, someone could be in their prep period and have like this moment and just hit the book me and, and pull someone in before they forget, right? And like, okay, I can do it at this time. Um, and I, so kudos to our coaches for their willingness to be flexible. We had lots of ways we could look at this and they could be like, one day in one building and one day in another building and kind of set that schedule, but they really advocated for like a level of flexibility so they could be more responsive across the buildings and across the teachers where the hotspots were at the time. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Question um, or a couple maybe, but um, where did that jump come from? That 93 from, from two years ago to this year, we're at 550. Just that the contact. I mean, is that word of mouth? Is that just there's more more of you to be able to respond? Is there's it more of us to respond? And last year we didn't collect data, but also the 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 real huge new thing. I think one of the big things on top of the fact that there's more of us to respond. So that's all of us cumulatively together. Right. But um, we have new like the math program that Lindsay started implementing right before the pandemic started, right? You guys started it. They didn't have a full year of it. And then last year was kind of wonky with the um, with the hybrid models. So it felt like Groundhog Day sometimes because you had the two kid, two kids, and then they, you know, you had to do some reteaching a little more often. So they didn't get a full year of just the regular program the whole year. So math was still pretty new. And then now this year we implemented so many new things for literacy. K-8, pre-K-8 even, you know? Yeah. And so when you're doing something new like that in math and reading and writing and word study, you know, phonics, all those kind of things. Um, and not everyone has experience with some of those things, even if they're new to us or brand new teachers. We have a lot of brand new teachers too, especially in the K-2 to zone. Yeah, this year. A lot of, just this year just happened to be that way, which is wonderful and exciting because they're very um, open to, to help and support and learning. Yeah. So it's been great and enthusiastic. Um, so so I, I agree with all of that and, I, and they're the ones that are doing it every day. But I also think um, you can't 
ever dismiss that notion of building relationships. And yeah. we worked really hard, as, as they said, about it's, this is student centered, not teacher centered. Mm -hmm. So this is really about partnering with teachers. And, and these five coaches really, they were trained in student centered coaching. That's partly why we hired them, right? Like that, it's a, it's a specific coaching model. Um, and that's what we were looking for. We knew what we were looking for. And so we hired for that purpose. They worked really, they know how to build relationships effectively and quickly. And then as a district, we agreed in all the, across all the administrators, this is a non-evaluative role. Student-centered coaching should never be an evaluative role, but we wanted to make sure that there was no confusion <laughs> around that. Um, and that there, and while they meet with principals, there is no connection to evaluation or to any individual teacher. And so I think over time that there was a level of trust built around there too. Like they're really here for support, um, you know? And, and so that I think does, even though we have new teachers, it takes other teachers in the building to, to use the coaches um, or access the coaches, <laughs> use not a good word, um, access the coaches and, and also just portray a level of, of positivity. And at the middle school, it was a big leap. Um, and, and, you know, they've made great gains, it seems, um, cause just because they haven't had that level of coaching um, at all to build up. Because there used to be a stigma, stigma when teachers asked for help. I remember this was years ago when I was subbing. Oh, yeah. And they, there was, it was like, I really don't want to raise my hand or I don't want to reach out, but I'm, I'm so glad that you have this program. And it's, it's really encouraging them to ask. Right. We're all learners. Yeah. yeah. We probably have time for one question. Do you think, is there any other question? Got a money question? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna ask one. Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously it's a successful program, and I would like to see it expand more um, into. I, I'm sure there's STEM coaches and science coaches and stuff like that, um, or or just even building upon the the math and English, maybe at the high school level or whatever. Um, uh, but and then there are different funding streams. You know, some are grants. All the COVID money is going to dry up, dry up eventually, but. I know Title I gets federal funding and stuff like that. Is coaching available for that type of stuff too? Yeah, so um, we have one more year after this school year that we can continue to fund some of the coaches through the federal funds. The others, if we keep it in the local budget, then we have that. Um, coaching can be funded under literacy coaching and numeracy coaching, math coaching, can be funded, uh, funded under Title I, but we would have to change our model. And it could influence our access to other staff who are currently paid in, under Title I, especially given the fact that our community's free and reduced lunch rate keeps going down instead of up um, because paperwork isn't getting filled out or the demographics are changing. I'm not sure what it is. Um, so the answer is yes, some districts fund coaches through Title I. That would be hard for us, yeah. um, probably. Uh, there are, you know, like I'll certainly be exploring ways in which I can present to you ways to fund coaches after next year's funding runs out. Um, but I, that I'm still in the exploration phase at the moment. Um, did I answer all of them? All no, the no, no, yeah. No, yeah. that was the, oh. and I know Title I funding because yeah. of the free and reduced lunch has already been screwed up and stuff, but yeah, it's more for the peanut gallery who might decide to, to live stream this who complain about every dime that we spend. But the the benefits of the coaching to the teachers and to the kids is is massive. So Especially if you have to with pay all of the new materials yeah. we have, I and mean, it's a lot to ask teachers to do that all on their own. And while they have colleagues, those teachers are teaching yeah. in classrooms with people, right? And and so they can't always just have the door open and chat with the teacher next door. They have those people are teaching, and and so this gives and there's never enough planning time. So those this, these. They have access to coaches who really can dedicate the time and expertise, which I think is really critical. Um, literacy and math coaches co can coach across disciplines and should. Um, I know that we're expand I know in the elementary world, it's, it's in lots of ways, not just the ELA programming and the math programming, 
Um, and at the middle school, there's they're branching out um, outside of ELA and math, uh, which is fantastic and necessary because uh, there's literacy in every subject and there's numeracy in every subject and there's instructional strategies that cross subjects um, and they're skilled in those. And so as those relationships build, I think people will see value in that, but it will take a little bit longer because the name sort of limits them at first. I've been working with teachers across the disciplines. So, yeah, so that's really exciting. I see that I see the opportunity for growth there. So the first the first year um, I sat on the board, I think we hired, we budgeted for a, a coach. Mm -hmm. Second year, I don't think we did because I don't think we really, it was one of those things that we, we had. We kept the one coach we had. Yeah, we had we, needs. I think we but, found somebody but, else. We had another one in the budget, but I think we couldn't find anybody. Yeah, but, I had a year. Given that year. scenario, not being able to find somebody, I think it's. You know, for this budget year, I think it's important that we look at another one. Um, just my opinion. That's that's an issue for the finance so, committee, but well, in it's next, important. Yeah. Yeah. So in the next couple of months, we'll be bringing up staffing and we'll be bringing up the curriculum budget. Um, and so next month we start on the curriculum budget here. Um, that'll be something you get to do with me. It'll be so <laughs> fun. <laughs> Um, is the Title I and No Child Left Behind the same? Yeah, they're funded under the same source, basically. Yeah. So we'll, but thank you for raising it. Um, and we'll definitely do some homework if you hear of anything before I do. I'm always, oh, my ears are always open. I want to thank the coaches so much for spending time um, after your day joining Absolutely. us. For Nicole for sending stuff our way, <laughs> despite the fact that you couldn't be here. Um, I, I want to pay attention to time. If you have questions that come up, feel free to write me. You can reach the coaches as well, uh, but feel free to write me and I can collect them and also send that out, um, whatever is efficient for you. Um, but, you know, they're doing great work and they can't speak about teachers. So <laughs> don't ask them about individual teachers, but, um, you know, if it's your own child, that's a different story. Um, okay, Matt, anything else? No, I think we're good. Okay, so our next Thank meeting. You Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, our next fun. meeting is February 8th and it'll be at 3.30 here. Yeah, good. Thanks. thanks. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. That yeah. was nice. Nice and yes. concise, Angela. Thank you. I need to drop teachers in positive senses.